and then you have leptin, which also is the uh, it's the leptin fat pathway, and that's an extremely important pathway in humans because fat is our primary fuel and not sugar. So, how do you live a long, healthy life? How do you reduce your risk of cancer? How do you treat cancer, even if you've got it? How do you reduce your risk of heart disease? How do you treat heart disease, even if you've got it? How do you reduce your risk of obesity or diabetes? Or how do you treat obesity or diabetes, even if you have it? You do it by the same mechanisms that nature has endowed us with to outlive a, an apparent famine. And one has to realize that these are very ancient mechanisms. These mechanisms go back uh, you know, billions of years, probably. They certainly go back to one single cell organism, so it really makes no difference what a person's inclination is to how old the Earth is, how long man has been around. But these are extremely ancient mechanisms. And they certainly go back to a time prior to oxygen having been available in the atmosphere because life had to flourish on Earth before there was sufficient oxygen in the atmosphere for fat burning to take place. So glucose was almost assuredly a fuel that was used long before fat was available to use as a fuel. So these pathways that regulate lifespan and therefore regulate symptoms of aging and disease arose in an environment where glucose was the primary fuel and where glucose and protein were the primary nutrients, macronutrients, necessary for reproduction to take place or not. That's important to realize. And the interesting part is that even though fat is our primary fuel and the primary hormone that tells the brain and the rest of the body, therefore, how much fat is available and whether you should be hungry or not and whether you should make fat or burn fat and uh, whether you should be inflamed, whether cancer, whether cells should reproduce, that has a whole lot to do with human aging and lifespan. That hormone, leptin, is actually regulated more by sugar than by fat. So sugar and protein are the two nutrients that regulate the three parallel pathways that control aging in humans. And if you want to essentially beat nature at its own game, in other words, we have no steps, we have no footsteps to follow to know how to be healthy. We really can't use Paleolithic man as an example because if there was an optimal diet for Paleolithic man that nature intended them to eat, it wasn't so that they could live a long, healthy life. It was so that they could reproduce quickly so that if they got eaten by a favorite tiger, it wouldn't matter. So nature's intent for our Paleolithic man, when life was much more dangerous than it is now, was to reproduce and get it out of the way before you die. And then nature didn't care. We can't. So we, you know, it's, it's really a moot point to some extent as to what Paleolithic man ate. We can't necessarily. It might have been a great diet. But it might not have been. That's not what nature's intent is. All we can do is use the best science available that we, that we have currently available, use it, study it, and see what it tells us about what we should be eating to live a long, healthy, post-reproductive lifespan, which is unnatural. But that's certainly what you and I want, and that's certainly what all my patients want. So in that respect, both you and I, Joe, are practicing uh, unnatural medicine. We're not practicing natural medicine. I like that. I like that viewpoint. It's going to change my whole uh, perspective. But what you've just shared is profound, and I'm sure the listeners to this recording are, you know, just their mouths are dropping, or their jaws are dropping, rather. It's just, that is a profound bit of wisdom that I don't think hardly a, but a handful of people, and certainly clinicians or researchers, or clinical researchers, are understand, let alone share with people. No, that's correct, and it's uh, it's so unfortunate. And the 
And the reason for it, I think it's just as profound in a negative way, and that is that uh, clinicians, certainly most MD clinicians, learn from drug reps, or they, they learn from going to medical meetings if they even attend them without playing golf. And they, they if, if, even if they are wanting to learn this stuff, and they, and they do read medical literature, let's say they do study medical journals, but just about 75% of all studies published in medical journals are financed by the pharmaceutical companies. And they're not, please understand, the pharmaceutical companies do not do studies that they publish for the sole purpose of trying to understand some truth to make people healthy. They're publishing studies as part of the marketing effort to sell a drug. And uh, the playing field, so to speak, is not level. They will publish the studies that will give them or give their drug a better image. And if there's a study that is negative to their drug, they will publish it. And they, they, they tend to model the experiment uh, in such a way that there will be a positive outcome. And as I say, if, they, if there isn't by some chance, it'll never get published and nobody will ever hear about it. Uh, I, I do think this is very powerful news and very, very powerful science that has direct clinical application so that if a person were to uh, restrict the uh, amount of sugar-forming foods in their diet, so that insulin stays low and leptin stays low, and that uh, they did not go on a high-protein diet uh, as, as a substitute on this low-carbohydrate diet. In other words, if they went on a low-carbohydrate, just moderate protein that just met their absolute needs and filled in the uh, hunger and fuel needs with fat, thereby restricting uh, mTOR in addition to insulin and leptin, that you will then maximally uh, improve the genetic expression of the maintenance and repair processes that we talked about that are so instrumental in allowing uh, a much greater lifespan and improved health in these laboratory animals. 